I want to start actually by talking about where I um, where I began the, the question that I began this whole project with in the very beginning, with, which was what is Polish about Polish Lysenkoism. And I think that the reason, um, as a graduate student, I was sort of pushed uh, faced personally with this question immediately is because there is a certain certainly a culture among Polish historians to see this whole period as a bit of an anomaly, just this sort of like culture that was um, briefly sort of stuck on the country um, to which people were forced to conform and then it was gotten rid of at the moment that it could be. Um, there's definitely, I think, you see that trend among Polish historians uh, today, a lot of them. Um, and it also, I would say, to a certain extent, there um, maybe in the culture of Slavic studies in the United States, for example, to say, why should we look at Polish socialist realism? What is just completely derivative? What does it tell us anyway about the larger topic? of socialist realism. And I think there's probably no better, um, if you were to sort of follow along with that um, interpretation, I think there's certainly no better symbol in architecture than the Palace of Culture here in Warsaw, which um, the reason I chose this image with Shrubmiestja, the midtown, the sign there, so you actually know you're looking at Poland. Many of you would probably think, oh, that's Moscow, because it's virtually identical to all those same counterparts in Moscow. Um, in biology, a great sort of uh, piece of evidence for this kind of point of view is that there's nothing important here would be this book published by uh, Vladimir Shmihawolf, um, The Origin of Life on Earth in 1945, which is, um, the title probably sounds familiar to you because it is just essentially, the, not only the title, but the content is virtually identical with a book that then later is um, published um, by Oparin, The Origin of Life, five years later. What's funny about Mihailov's book is that he presents this whole primordial soup theory as though it sprung fully formed from his own head in, in this first book. Um, Oparin is listed in a section for further reading, but that's it. I mean, it's just very strange um, to, to read this. Um, Mihailov, by the way, was among those who was among the biggest promoters of Lysenkoism in Poland. Um, went on to, when you talk to a lot of biologists today, they'll um, talk very bitterly about how he just, um, he, he, had a, he was very influential with the Ministry of Education. He was responsible for writing biology textbooks. Um, even as late as 1961, which is well after Lysenkoism in Poland ends, he's still writing textbooks uh, which, um, in which he gives, say, a page and a half to, um, to Mendel and five pages to Maturin. So this is, so this is this is what Mihailov did. And I think it, uh, there is no, the question of how is it, um, as I'm going to focus on a bit, how is it that Lysenkoism actually comes to Poland? I have myself never been able to find any specific, you know, say, smoking gun letter or any piece of correspondence which would explain uh, any of the arrangements. Um, although I think Mihailov was probably instrumental in, in that process, for sure. Um, so, so there you have it. I mean, there's nothing original about any of this. Oh, by the way, these are um, this uh, Biblioteca Popularna Naukova. It's like the Library of Popular Science. And this, um, the Oparin book, as well as Chikave i Pozitechne, which means interesting and useful. So these are, for, these are popular science books. They're not um, written for scientists at all. Um, now, fortunately, very early on, uh, even before I went to Warsaw to begin my research, I was writing a paper for a class on the rehabilitation, the reconstruction of Warsaw after the Second World War, and I found this really, really fascinating essay by Shimon Sirkus, um, who was one of the, um, he was one of the uh, sort of major figures in Polish modernism during the interwar period. He's interested in Bauhaus, he worked in Paris and Vienna and Berlin. Um, he uh, was interested in um, formalism. And there was this whole question, um, socialist realism being something that's brought in along with Lysenkoism as part of in collectivization and industrialization. Um, there was this whole question in socialist realism over trying to find works that would be, um, the idea was that it would be um, what was it? nationalist in form and socialist in content. So you had to find the nationalist form. There's this sort of um, need to, in each place, in each little democracy, to find which one might have to contribute to the greater goal of constructing a socialist realist aesthetic. So he writes this piece where he basically says that what you should, he uses the, the, the theory of Lachern and Lysenko as a way of formulating a Polish socialist realism. Um, and he mentions these different figures who he feels as though these Polish, um, these Polish um, artists and architects, who, Jasinski, Ciszewski, Malevich, Szynajca, who, um, whose work should, should inform this, the creation of this socialist realism. These are the people who we can use to build a model. Now, this was fascinating to me for two reasons. One, it's the use of a scientific theory um, where in order to formulate a um, aesthetic theory, in both cases, the question of heredity is central. Um, and what's even more interesting is when you look at the names he mentions, um, these are all like, um, like him, 
major figures in the modernism during the interwar period in Poland. These are people who went to the Soviet Union, um, they went to Berlin, um, they were into suprematism, um, they were into Cubism, Expressionism, and these were, the, these were the, the major figures. And as you can also tell from the dates here, they were all dead by the time he, he published this. <laughs> now, not a single one was alive. Yashinsky was, um, he was shot, he was arrested in, uh, in 1937 in Moscow and shot. Um, Shainatza died in um, Leningrad, I think, uh, or no, Malevich died in Leningrad. Shainatza died at the start of the Second World War. Chishevsky had rise, the war was over. So what was really interesting to me is one, he's, it's, it's, this is sort of, and this has, I guess, been sort of the idea which I've held ever since whenever I look at Lysenkoism is this, is what do people talk about when they talk about Lysenkoism? Why are they talking about this? Because it's only rare, it's not very often, aside from, I guess, the Hudson and Richens book, which is, has come up earlier, where you really see just sort of a straightforward um, approach to what is he saying, and is it correct or is it incorrect, is it science or is it not science, very often the Lysenkoism is being taken up as like a vehicle to get someone where they want to go. They use it to accomplish a goal. And that is clearly what he's doing here. So he, what he's trying to do is he's trying to get the work of people he likes to play a fundamental role in what is going to be the, the style of architecture, which is, for the foreseeable future is going to be the, the acceptable one, and conveniently, it, you know, these are all obviously people who could easily, uh, he's putting at risk for being accused of, uh, putting himself at risk as well, of being accused of bourgeois cosmopolitanism, et cetera. However, the only person he's actually put at risk is himself because they're gone. You know, so it's very, and it's very, you know, very good, very, <laughs> very strategic. So as I said, that really ha um, helped set me out um, to take on this topic, <laughs> um, to always be aware of that. How are people using this idea? Now, I want to talk about one specific figure who is very central to Polish Lysenkoism, Stanislav Skowron. But before I do that, I just want to sort of give a brief overview of what happened, when it comes in, when it goes out, um, et cetera. This, um, first of all, in, shortly after the famous session in Moscow, the, um, co the World Congress of Int Intellectuals took place in Wrocław, Poland, where a um, proposal, the Soviet delega delegation wanted to have a proposal included um, the final platform rejecting genetics as bourgeois sci science, and it was rejected. This was not successful. Now, that's kind of, um, kind of funny, because if there's anywhere where it should have been possible, it's Poland. I mean, there's never any question which way Poland was going after the war, unlike other places where perhaps in a, for a time you're not really sure uh, how it's all going to turn out. The Red Army never leaves Poland. It's clear Poland is going to be a Soviet ally. So if, there was any, if this had been sort of a well-thought-out progr programmatic approach, that should have happened, but it didn't. Um, and in fact, the coverage of the, um, in the Polish press of this session in Wrocław makes no mention of the proposal. And not only that, but it publishes an interview with Julian Huxley. Well, it's this sort of piece that Huxley originally wrote for the BBC. It's this sort of like imagined interview between himself and T.H. Huxley, his predecessor, describing the amazing advances that have taken place since um, his, his, his grandfather's time. And, um, and so, and he makes these favorable mentions of Mendel. And this is after what's happened in Moscow. So it's, it's really this sort of lack of methodical um, approach is, I think, qu quite important to note. Um, that said, the, uh, shortly thereafter, um, in March of 1949, there is a one-day session that is held in Warsaw. Um, it's only one day, and there's no debate. It's not like the week-long session in Moscow at all. There's no, everyone who speaks essentially condemns genetics, speaks up on behalf of Lysenkoism. It's led by Jan Dombowski, who would soon become the president of the Polish Academy of Sciences. Um, I think Dembowski might have also been instrumental, although he really stops writing about Lysenko, he stops even really mentioning it after about 1954. Um, but Dembowski, he was, um, definitely had the reputation of being sort of a leftist in toward Poland. He was one of the few who actually stood up and protested against um, ghetto benches, if you're aware of the ghetto benches in Polish universities during the interwar period, Jews were forced to sit in separate benches. Um, he was one of the few who protested this. He, uh, published a series of broadcasts on Radio Moscow. He won this, was nominated for a Stalin Prize. Um, so he was, and he was, though not a member of the Communist Party, he was among those, among the few, um, say, scientists and intellectuals who were sympathetic to communism who had any influence at all at the university. So he's a very important figure in terms of the party's influence at the universities, especially um, uh, in Warsaw, more, more actually more particularly at a place like Krakow, which has really had the reputation of being um, the sort of um, university where it was very difficult to get people to rebe the rebel university get people to difficult to get people to conform. So Dembowski leads this session, and 
What's really fascinating to me is that there's only one person, when you read the text of the um, session, uh, there's only one person who raises any kind of a question at all. You know, it's like the two sciences, this is the road we're taking, genetics is, is, um, is not the way we're going. And only one person, Vishnevsky from Warsaw, raises the question and says, well, can't, can't you have both? I mean, I, I'm, I'm willing to agree that perhaps the role of the environment in Haredi has been, um, has been neglected by geneticists, but doesn't genetics also have something to offer? Should we be throwing out the baby with the bathwater? And I thought Dembowski's response is really fascinating. I don't think you have to read between the lines. I think it's right there in the lines what he's saying there. He makes this elaborate analogy with chess. And what he says is that in the beginning of a chess game, every opponent is different. And in the beginning of the game, there's a lot of moves you can make, a lot of potential moves that you're right, some which are wrong. Um, as the game progresses, however, you eventually reach the point where there's only one right move, and any other move will end the game and end in checkmate. And this is where we are, which I think is pretty, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it, <laughs> I, well, and, and so there, you, and that's it, and there you go. And so that, that and off, and that, that begins. Then a number of things are published. Um, there are stories in the newspaper about the translations of Lysenko and Maturin's work into Polish. Um, uh, Land in Bloom is, is shown in Poland, the film about Maturin, um, and, and on it goes from there. Now, following that, there are a series of four major follow-up conferences, each of which serves a slightly different purpose and each of which has a slightly different tone to it given when it takes place. The first is in Kuznitsa, uh, December 27, 1950 to January 6, 1951. This is a, a picture um, of showing you where Kuznitsa is. It's in the Tatra Mountains, south of Zakopane in southern Poland. It takes forever to get to Kuznitsa. It is really remote. It is really isolated. Given that this took place um, shortly after Christmas, most people traveling in Poland would have had to leave on Christmas Day. Um, and then they stay there through the New Year. And they're really isolated. And it was published, the transcripts from this were published um, as a two-volume set um, and it was very much a hothouse atmosphere, is really you know, the sense you get from, I mean, there was no, uh, anyone, you know, there were a couple of people who tried to give presentations, like Władysław Schaefer, a botanist, the Jagiellonian, he just talks about that the environment plays an important role in the shaping of heredity. Doesn't mention Maturin, doesn't mention Lysenko, doesn't give any kind of, you know, um, indication of loyalty, and that is simply not accepted. He's excoriated, he, for, criticized for his refusal to be self-critical, um, and this is just really the whole tone of Kuznitsa. Uh, and the purpose was really to, I, I would say, enforce conformity among the, um, the biologists. Now, the next one takes place in Jivnuf on um, summer. Jivnuf, tiny remote town in the Baltic Sea. Once again, you really, I, I think the idea is you really don't have much contact with anyone who's not there at the conference. That's the point. Um, Jivnuf for about a, for a month. Um, and this was primarily to train the up and coming generation of young biologists, um, people who are graduate students. Uh, they were there being sort of indoctrinated, being taught about giving these lectures, um, talking about their work. And then the following two are in Kortovo, um, which is sort of an outlying district of Olsztyn in central Poland. Um, and ironically enough, they're held on the, in, the, in a building which had previously been a, a mental hospital in St. Asan. Interesting choice of venue. I don't really know if anyone <laughs> recognized the irony. Um, anyway, by this time, by, by the time, what happens in Poland is after Stalin's death, this is a very quick process then. Of, uh, and, and there's the thaw, and there's a greater room in Poland to talk about and be critical of um, Polish socialism and the regime. And Lysenkoism is very slowly ushered out um, over the course of these, this time period. And finally, in 1956, there is a conference held sponsored by Poprostu, which was this journal, which was like a student journal, which had been sort of a place where a lot of stuff that was really critical of socialism in Poland had been being published. A lot of articles, they sponsored this day-long session, which basically serves the purpose of saying it's, it's it, Lysenko is roundly criticized, maturinism is criticized, you know, all these different, um, a number of things come up. I mean, you have a lot of real anger about the, you know, so you have scientists saying it's a shame well, we never have any opportunity to travel abroad. You know, if we were athletes, we could just travel abroad. But since we're scientists, we don't. Lack of contact with the West. Everything kind of comes out at this session. And Lysenkoism um, is essentially, for all intents and purposes, over in Poland in 56. And then there's this sort of a semi-revolution, one of those turning points in history that doesn't really turn things. Gmuka comes into power. He's a Polish nationalist, but things go back pretty soon to the way they were before. So that's a rough timeline, a rough outline of what happens. Now, so I said one of the more interesting figures, and I would say in many ways almost um, unfairly or not, the um, in a way like the poster boy for Polish Lysenkoism is Stanisław Skowron. Um, and that I think it's all really related to a specific incident, which I'll mention.
But um, Skovron was um, among the most important figures in Polish genetics. In the interwar period, he came to the United States, uh, studied, uh, he worked in T.H. Morgan's lab at Columbia University, very briefly, actually. It was kind of funny, because this is always mentioned in his, um, in his biography that he worked in Morgan, with Morgan using the fly room. Uh, in fact, what happened was he, he was supposed to spend six months here in New York City, and then spent six months in Italy. He spent two months, he'd recently been married, he spent two months in New York and then got, basically got a doctor's note saying that the climate was really bad for him, he should be better off in Italy, better climate, <laughs> and his wife joined him in Italy. And it was really, it's which is, you know, and uh, Morgan was not happy, very upset, and he said, I, if you send me people again who are, you know, only going to stay for two months, there's no point, it's not healthy for the lab, nothing gets done. But he's, and he said, and I don't think he was sick, I think he missed his wife, I don't, you know, so. <laughs> but that said, he was still granted several more Grants with Rockefeller, he then went on to um, Denmark, to Great Britain. Um, and uh, he was also, he was one of two recommended by this uh, Edmil Godlewski Jr., uh, his mentor at the Agolini in Krakow. And where you can see when you read the correspondence in the Rockefeller archives, Godlewski's just asked who would benefit from this. And Skovron is one of the names given, and the other one is Marchlewski, who also is an interesting case as well. Um, so he goes, he comes back, and he becomes one of the most important figures, um, one of the few people in Poland then with any real knowledge of genetics. In the correspondence of Rockefeller as well, they say Polish genetics is really backward. We really need to do something. There's no, Polish biology in general is very backward. They need help. They need to, we need to send these people overseas. So he goes back, he works at the Jagiellonian University in Kraków, and in so November 6, 1939, is rounded up with the rest of the faculty in the Sonda Action on Krakow, when they're all arrested, sent to Sachsenhausen, and then sent on to, to Dachau. Now, um, in Dachau, what's, what's interesting, he, Skovron is able to, um, to survive. Actually, well, before I mention Dachau, let me mention he, the, the eugenics as well. This Polish eugenics movement is notably uninfluential. They have almost no impact whatsoever. In fact, they have no really essential impact upon government policy and toward Poland. Thanks, I think, to the influence of Catholicism, the Pilsudski regime was not interested. Um, but Skovron, if you follow his publications, goes from being somewhat skeptical of eugenics to uh, increasingly critical, uh, no, increasingly favorably, favorably inclined towards eugenics uh, as the 1930s progresses. Uh, strangely enough, the, uh, the leader of the Polish eugenics movement, this guy Leon Wiernitz, after World War II, he actually tries to get the movement going again after World War II, which is just really bizarre to me. I mean, why, why you would, what he was thinking, I don't know. And of course, because of Lysenkoism, and among any number of other reasons, there was no way that was ever going to happen. So he get, becomes increasingly interested in eugenics, um, and really, I would say, promotes, starts promoting in his works positive eugenic policies for Poland. Now, he then ends up in Dachau. And the way in which he is able to survive uh, in Dachau is because he is appointed to work as a biologist on this garden plantation run by Heinrich Himmler. Um, Himmler, like many of the Nazis, believed that medicine had been corrupted by the influence of Jewish physicians. He was very interested in natural, uh, natural um, medicinal plants, um, this kind of thing. So he, I, mean, I think probably one of the stranger locations produced by the history of the 20th century is, Doc, is Himmler's garden in Dachau. I mean, what a bizarre thing to have in, in a concentration camp. And Skovron worked on this um, garden plantation. And as he describes it, you know, these, fiel these fields filled with fruits and vegetables, vitamins for healthy German children, this was the point of this. Um, and what's interesting is that the way in which he describes it in his memo memoirs published after the war, Memories from My Stay in Dachau, the organization, organization of scientific work in a camp, he talks about how um, what he and his colleagues would do was basically play at being scientists. And because their captors weren't scientists, they had no idea that what they were doing wasn't science. They would make up these meaningless tasks just to be able to continue to be in practicing as scientists because that were, they got relatively better treatment as scientists rather than doing other forms of labor. And, um, and he, and, it, it, it was, it was, was I, like, just for example, he says, if it is okay with the reader, I will stop using quotation marks when I refer to scientific work in Dachau. It just means more labor for the editor. I have no doubt we all know what I mean. And he describes the types of experiments he and his colleagues would do. Um, a botanist um, uses rods, lays paper strings. They would construct an instrument for measuring plant growth, and they're impressed. They come in and look at this wonderful scientific instrument this scientist has created, and uh, it's just basically a way of keeping busy, essentially. Um, he talks about one of his colleagues, Kotsvi, 
I will never forget the daily routine of our pharmaceutical chemistry specialist, Kotsby. Mornings after arriving on the plantation, he would come to the workshop and pour out a bag of chamomile seeds mixed with sand. Use it, making use of a pen holder with a pen stuck in it, he would divide the sand in the seeds into two separate piles. This little game would go on for about two hours, at which point he would mix it all back together again so as to have something to do the next day. And this, this was the scientific work that he was conducting in Dachau, but it saved his life. He, he was able to um, he receive much better treatment by working for Himmler than he would have otherwise. Now, the war ends, um, and he publishes, 1947, he publishes a book, Zaris Nauki o Jadishnosti, um, a brief outline of the science of inheritance, and he mentions Lysenko, uh, this new, the Lysenko school. Now, in the Soviet Union, he mentions the Hudson and Richens book, and he, Skovron is, is, is critical, dismissive of Lysenko. He's, he mentions Hudson and Richens, which he describes as a very, as a balanced, um, as a balanced investigation. He says, I mention Hudson's opinion so as to be unbiased as possible and give you my views on the research of one of the opponents of Russian genetics. It's difficult to make and take more neutral opinion given the recent criticism of Russian genetics coming from other schools of genetics. No doubt further research will resolve these issues. So it's pretty clear he's not, he doesn't think much of Lysenko. Well, he hears then in 1948 um, about what's happened in Moscow and he enlists the help of friends and family members to rush out and buy up as many copies of this book as they can because he's scared to death now of what's going to happen. Uh, and I think that one act, because that when I was doing my research, that came up, that anecdote came up no matter who you talk to. And I think for that reason, I think that there's something so dramatic about that that really has, as I said, made him like the, the figure most identified, fairly or not, with Polish Lysenkoism. Now what's strange though to me, um, as this goes on, um, he, uh, so then he gives another, um, another talk a few months after that, um, in, in, the, in November of 1948, giving a talk to inaugurate the new ad ad academic year at the Jagiellon University in Krakow. And now his tone on Lysenko is completely different in this speech. And he speaks very positively of Lysenko. Um, so he says, well, it's, it's, it seems to me that, that the great service of this school, the last sentence, is not just in critiquing contemporary genetics for being overly reliant upon statistics, but also drawing attention to methods which can help work out when and under what conditions featured acquired during an individual's existence can be transmitted to the next generation. He also mentions, connects genetics with Germany. We all remember well the kinds of results this one-sidedness um, led to and the unnatural fruit it produced after being planted in the political foundations of, of Hitler's Germany, the, the, the overestimation of the role of the genes. So this complete you know, turnaround, he's saying, clearly he's saying, what you would say, he's being politically saying what he needs to say. But what's strange to me about Skavron is he goes even further over the course of his career. Um, in this speech, he then also goes on to quote an article in the American Journal of Science. Now, it's pretty clear to me that throughout the socialist period in Poland, Skavron always had access to science because he's always quoting articles in science. So he was getting the issues regularly. And I can go and I can always find which ones he's talking about. If I page through long enough, it's like, oh, this is the what he's talking about. Um, but in each instance, he is radically distorting the content to the point where it's almost, it's just bizarre that the, the extent to which he, he, he does this. Uh, in this article, for example, he says that, um, he, he, he claims that, in a, that someone has published an article in Science uh, basically arguing that capitalism makes you mentally ill. Um, and that for doing this, for having published this article about um, capitalism, this person was, um, um, immediately suffered the consequences by being removed from their position as chairman of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, now, as a matter of fact, this I actually found the article he's talking about. It was by Condon, Science and the National Welfare. And yes, he does make a comment about mental illness, but it's nothing like what Skovron said it is. You know, in fact, what he'd said was psychology, psychiatry. He's talking about what the government's agenda should be for the coming year in terms of funding for scientific research. But he's not saying anything like Skovron says he's saying, unsurprisingly. But what's strange is that this is just one of many examples you find over the next several years where Skovron will do this. Just, and he's going, what's funny to me is he goes so much further than he has to. It, he would, it would have been fine for him to simply make the requisite, requisite statements on behalf um, in favor of Lysenkoism, but he does, makes up this kind of stuff. It, and and he, he's, he doesn't, it doesn't even serve a, a purpose politically. I don't think it helped his career, certainly because it goes on for so long, even after the point where it's pretty clear that this is no longer as necessary. Um, like after, uh, once Stalin dies, things become pretty clear pretty quickly that um, 
the, the, the atmosphere in Poland is changing, and yet Skowron continues to um, do this kind of thing. Um, and he even and he'll talk about like there's one um, he, he talks in another article he talks about Kurt Stern who he worked with who he met I guess in, in Morgan's lab and says that Stern told him that Morgan uh, Kurt, that Morgan actively tried to suppress um, experiments which proved that you know, um, Lamarckism um, and it's just kind of funny to me why would he go out of his way to even mention someone he knew I mean there's just something going on there with him that I think is really fascinating he would also mention. Um, and one of, a student who was at Jivnu remembers, she mentions Professor X, I, it's got to be him because I've read the transcript, and she says he talked about heredity. Um, he mentioned a number of examples intended to illustrate the inheritance of acquired characters. He asserted that peach trees when cultivated on islands of the Pacific become evergreen. That's actually a reference to Emile Bordage's work, um, a re reunion I don't know if you're all familiar with, but these were, these, these were experiments which were widely used as evidence for uh, Lamarckism in the interwar period, what he had done, Bordage had gone to Re Reunion, which is near Madagascar, planted these peach trees, uh, which became subpersistent in the tropical climate, and he claimed the effect was inherited. Well, it turned out Bordage actually had left Reunion and just got word back. People told him, so there was never any kind of proof of this. In other experiments as well, he talked about John Tower's work um, claiming to approve the inheritance of striping patterns in the Colorado potato beetle, all stuff which was not, which was uh, debunked, if you will. Um, but he would, he would use these examples. Now, so what's interesting to me is that I really feel as though Scovro, when you look at his experiences, on the one hand, he's exposed to the worst excesses um, the, the, of you, Nazi eugenics, and then he comes back to Poland, the war's over, and then genetics, his science in which he works, is then banned. It's like he gets it from both sides. Um, and it really is, um, to me, reflective of this sort of analysis, of classic analysis of Cheswell Miłosz and the captive mind, People in the West are often inclined to consider the lot of the converted countries in terms of might and coercion. That is wrong. There is an internal longing for harmony and happiness that lies deeper than ordinary fear or the desire to escape misery of physical destruction. The fate of completely consistent non-dialectical people is a warning for many an intellectual. All about him in the city streets, he sees the frightened shadows of internal exiles, irreconcilable, non-participating, eroded by hatred. Uh, and that's where I think I'll leave it. Thank you.